Hey everyone, I'm Stephanie Affinito, the Chief Bookologist and Podcast Host at Get Literate and AlitLife.com. And I am here with Donna Fields of Scaffolding Magic. Donna, welcome back. Oh my goodness, thank you. It's just so exciting to be here with you again. Yeah, so for those of you that don't know us together yet, Donna and I recently teamed up for a podcast episode on my Get Literate podcast. It's episode number 80, if you're interested. And we talked all things books and fairy tales as life coaching tools. I have always had a strong belief that books can change our lives if we just are open enough and listen to the lessons that we find in them. And Donna agrees. But not only that, feels that a particular genre can really make that coaching come to life. And that genre is fairy tales, something that wasn't always present in my reading life, something that I did not initially think could give me a life lesson in 2023 that would be all that worthy. And Donna completely changed my mind in that episode and literally flipped everything I thought about fairy tales and how they worked and how I could interpret them completely upside down. (laughs) So we didn't want the conversation to stop. And in fact, it hasn't. We have been voice messaging and emailing back and forth on this very topic. So we thought, why not keep the conversation going? So Donna, why don't you give them a little bit more of the backstory of what this series is going to be and and how fairy tales really can be an important tool, not only in our reading life, but our actual life too. Yeah, and this is going to be an ongoing conversation. So I can't summarize everything in in just three or four <laughs> minutes. And I, Stephanie, I, Stephanie and I are, are excited to get into one of the fairy tales. But Stephanie is so enthusiastic about literature and fairy tales, and specifically, and she wanted me to do my own podcast on fairy tales. And I said, "There's no way I'm going to do my own podcast on the fairy tales." But if you would like to do it with me. Stephanie has such enthusiasm for literature and for fairy tales, and she makes me up my game. So mm-hmm. I love the, the chemistry we have together, and I love the questions she has for me and her surprise, actually, and the way that fairy tales can be interpreted. So I love this opportunity to share with all of you as well. And we're going to see if we can convince you to look at everything, not just literature, but everything with a little more perspective and a little more analyzation and a little more depth. Yeah. Yeah. We're going to do that. (laughs) Great. great. So you started by giving me a little bit of homework, right? You wanted me to explore a particular fairy tale. So the idea is that we would just hop on a call together and pick a fairy tale and dissect it, talk about it, learn from it, flip it, think about the lessons that it can bring to our own lives. And we're starting today with the 12 dancing princesses, right? Yeah. And if you don't mind, Stephanie, what I'd like to do is also just a little bit of background of why I love fairy tales so much, because I really want to get into the the fairy tale that we picked for today. But just give background. And this is for all of the the monthly episodes we're we're going to record. I think that everyone can relate to what I'm going to say. I became really interested in fairy tales when I was very young because I read them constantly, almost as though it was a compulsion. And I met Stephanie because I actually ended up doing my dissertation, my, my doctorate on fairy tales. And people think, doctorate on fairy tales? Why in the world? And what I really wanted to understand were the subliminal messages that I knew I was getting from having read them so obsessively when I was young. And the thing is, I think it's normal because when we read fairy tales, there's something very satisfying about them, especially the versions that we read in the past like 60, 70 years. Before then, they were very dark. And Stephanie and I are going to talk about different versions of them because that's very important. We learn a lot more about the characters from the the original versions. But the the versions we're reading today, and especially the ones we see in the movies, We are drawn to the characters because everything is resolved really happily in the end. And we are asked to look at them as very black and white and to be drawn to these characters because they're exactly what the author wants us to think. We have the queen, the beautiful queen who usually dies in the first few minutes. She's always revered. And we have the beautiful princess who's victimized but is always saved in the end. And we have the prince who is really supposed to be daring and save the village or the princess at the last moment, 
And then we have the king, who's usually seen as a kind and generous person and really magnanimous and welcomes even the poorest princess into his castle. And then we have the witch, which Stephanie are going to talk about, yes. maybe not today in this in this fairy tale that we pick, but in the future, a lot, who's usually find some awful end. And so what we're going to be talking about is why fairy tales, if we don't really look at them carefully, we can, we relax when we read them because when the words once upon a time starts, we think oh, we're going to have a little conflict, but in the end, the last words, and they all lived happily ever after is really true or is it? And that's what we're going to talk about. Mm, what a cliffhanger. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so we're going to start with a fairy tale that I had never heard of before. You you sent me some options and I decided to go with this one. This one is 12 Dancing Princesses. And so I thought I would give an overview of it in case listeners don't know this fairy tale like I did. If you do, maybe it'll just be uh, a reminder or maybe just orient you to whatever version we're looking at today. And then we're going to get to it. So. 12 Dancing Princesses is, uh, it's it's interesting. Um, and it is about 12 princesses who sleep in 12 beds in the same room. And every night, their father, you know, keeps them locked up safely by locking the door of their room. But every morning when they wake up, their dancing shoes have been found to be worn through as if they had been out dancing all night. That couldn't possibly be, right? Because the king locked them in their room. And so he asks his daughters to explain, uh, but they refuse. So what does he do? The king promises his kingdom and each daughter to any man who can figure out this nighttime secret within three days. If they do, they get the girl. If they don't, they get to die. <laughs> So, you know, very typical, big, grand motions and fairy tales. So this one particular soldier is returning from war and he decides that he wants to answer the king's call after princes before him have tried and failed. And so as he's traveling there in the woods, he finds an old woman who gives him this enchanted cloak, kind of like an invisibility cloak so he can disappear and figure out what's going on. He just can't eat or drink anything given to him by the princesses. She says, pretend that you're fast asleep and then, you know, put on the cloak and figure out where they are. And so that's exactly what he did. At night, after he was in the castle, the princesses thought he was asleep. They dressed themselves up in these most beautiful gowns and escaped out of their room from a trap door in the floor. Now, the soldier sees this. He puts on that magic cloak and he follows them. Now, some of the princesses feel like there's something going on, the boat, you know, something's going on, but they they don't they don't figure out what it is. And all of these princesses end up going through kind of like these magical passageways. There's trees, there's leaves of silver and leaves of gold and leaves of glittering diamonds too. And the soldier's kind of taking little tokens as he goes so he can prove that this is what's going on. And what he finds is that when, when they get to where they are going, the 12 princesses end up finding 12 princes in 12 rowboats. And they row off together to a castle where they dance the night away. So we're getting there. We're getting there. So they dance the night away until their shoes are just unable to dance anymore and they leave. They keep doing this on a second night and a third night, and the, the soldier is watching them, but it's time to tell the king. And so he goes to the king with all of the tokens he has, which includes some branches, a golden cup, and he says, this is what I found. Now, at this point, the princesses realize they are caught, and so they confess what they have been up to in their little midnight dance-a-thons. The soldier gets to choose his wife, so he decides to choose the eldest princess because, well, he's not very young, and he's made the king's heir to the, the whole kingdom. The 12 princes who were with the princesses at night, unfortunately, are put under a curse for as many nights as they dance with the princesses. So let's pick this one apart, Donna. <laughs> 
talk to me about your thoughts on the 12 dancing princesses. Well, first, what I really want to do, because I do remember this when I was young, my my parents had left us with um, a series of fairy tales, these green books. Oh, I wish I remember what they're called, because I'm sure a lot of people have them. And we read over and over these fairy tales, or maybe I was the one that read them over and over. And I remember the 12 dancing princesses. And to me, it was the glitter of the diamonds and gold and, and silver on the trees and the mystery of where they went every night. And that's what I remember. And, and these gorgeous girls with their beautiful slip glass slippers or whatever type of slippers they were wearing. And they were dancing the night away in a unknown underground castle. So that's what I remember. And what is it that attracts you to? Because I, we were talking about different fairy tales. What attracted you to this one? Yeah. Well, you sent me three. And now I can't remember what the other two were. But the one of them was... Do you remember? You remember. There what was one Hansel and Gretel and the other one, uh, the oranges, something about the oranges, which we'll talk about in the future. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> that one was interesting. And so yeah. I I already knew one of them. And so I kind of got that off the plate because I wanted something new. Yeah. So it was between the 12 dancing princesses and the one with oranges the and orange fairies. cheese or yeah. something like that. I should know. Yeah. yeah. I and that but... one, when I first read through it, I thought, uh, yeah. I'm not so sure about that one. That one is a little bit out of out of my realm of understanding at the moment, but I get 12 dancing princesses. I get girls who want to dance the night away. I get the idea behind uh, this fairy tale a little bit more. So I admit, I did lean into what I thought was a little bit more familiar to me in the idea of fairy tales. And I love the idea of girls just dancing the night away without a care in the world, so much that their shoes got worn out <laughs> and they kept doing it again and again and again. So. Right. So what it sounds like, Stephanie, is you were attracted to the idea that these girls had, you know, sort of a, a freedom at night. They could do whatever they wanted to do. And what they wanted to do was move their body and, and express themselves. And with these yes. 12 probably gorgeous princes who rode them, they didn't have to do anything. The princes rode them across the lake and into this unknown castle and, and dance the night away. But let's look about it. Let's take a few of the elements apart and really see what we're talking about because this is what goes into our subliminal consciousness, especially girls in this case, that we, we need to think about. The first thing you said was that the king locked them safely away. We don't know if the girls had any say in whether they were being locked away. Why did the king decide to lock his 12 daughters into a room together? probably because he was trying to maintain their virginity. So let's talk about virginity. Why is virginity so important? It's important in a kingdom and it's important for many people in the world because they wanna make sure that their lineage is being followed. Now, it doesn't always work, but why is that important? So I don't know if you have any opinions about this, Stephanie. Do you think that it's important, first of all, that a woman marry a virgin? And do you think it's important that the man know exactly that, know very determinedly that he's the father of the, the children that he's raising? Well, I didn't know we were going here, Donna. <laughs> but we need to go here because exactly when the king locks the door without asking his daughters whether he wants them in there safely, you know, I'm, I'm making air quotes. This is exactly what we're taking in. And these. this is exactly what little girls are taking in. They need to be locked into a room safely by a man. Is that true? Right. Well, uh, no, I don't think so. Because part of this appeal was that these, you know, princesses were off doing whatever the heck they wanted at night. Something that made them happy and brought them joy and got them to be able to, to dress up and do all of the things. So I definitely... Now I forgot your original question, but <laughs> I'm I, sorry, I'm really no. taking you aback because you, we don't talk about this just for the listeners to know we no. don't talk about this beforehand. And what I love is Stephanie, I can see Stephanie processing this information. Yeah. I never thought we were going to go here. And it's exactly where we need to go for boys and girls. Yeah. Yeah. So then what, like, what do you think about? So, so yeah, you could see me processing in the moment. <laughs> yeah. If. How do you then, because this did not enter my mind, the, like, you know, I, when I saw, oh, the king locked him away, I thought, well, of course he did, because that's what they always do in, you know, in fairy tales. The girl always has to be protected or saved or kind of pushed aside. How do you know what you should pay attention to when you are- 
no, that's a great question. There's nothing that we should pay attention to. I focus on certain things that someone else might not focus on. And there are some things that probably don't catch my attention that someone else would think is incredibly significant. This I think is important because again, I never married. I never wanted to marry. I didn't have children and I didn't want to have children. And so these type of things are much more part of my scope thinking, why would I I let any man lock me away. Why would I let a woman lock me away? I'm doing really well on my own. And so this, just the first lines of the story, I realized when I was younger, never would have thought about it. As I'm older, I realize it's absolutely fine and positive for girls to be on their own. Marriage does not have to be the road for everyone. And I'm not saying it's not a positive path. I'm saying it doesn't have to be the path. So why is it important for us to focus on this? Very important. Very important. It, it, I think it affects especially girls in a subliminal way. So if you want, we can go into a little more or we can keep going. Oh, gosh, I want to do both, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, let's talk about then that you love the fact that they are free and dancing and they're with these 12 princes each one has its own prince it's not like they have to change partners they all have the person they want to be with again fascinating and that part i agree with it is beautiful it's just wonderful to think about these 12 girls locked away um, who have an escape and they go through a trap door well it's a fairy tale it's not a real life story it's a fairy tale what are they really doing we could say that they're they're in their subconscious, they're in a dream state. And in their dream state, instead of remembering that they're locked away in their rooms, they want to be dancing. And so they go through a trap door, they go through a woods, they cross a lake and go to an underground castle. Perfect. Usually in fairy tales, we have a forest and the forest means an un a change in paradigm. It's more of a change in consciousness. In this story, it's one of the only fairy tales that I remember. It doesn't have a forest. There's a lake. And the 12 princesses cross the lake. So this is what I do. I mean, I was an English literature major, and I analyze different elements of a story. So it's natural for me to look at the story and think, lake? Why did they cross the lake? What's the meaning of a lake? I don't know. When you think of a lake, Stephanie, what do you think of? And there's no right answer here. Just anything. Uh, when it, when I think of a lake, it's relaxation. It's downtime. It's a little less stressful. It's peaceful. That's what comes to my mind. Yeah. Perfect. We can have a lot of different meanings. For me, in this case, I thought about it a lot. And a lot of people consider a lake, especially in fantasy stories, as a yearning. And a lot of times the lake, because it's still water and there's some source is coming in, but it's mostly very still water. And so we can say it's a yearning, perhaps for love. And in fact, lakes often have the symbol, is the meaning, the, the sort of subliminal meaning of yearning for love. It's exactly what the girls are doing. They go through the trap door, they go through wood, they go to the shore, and here, magically, 12 princes waiting for them to row them across and dance. After going through, of course, the beautiful gold and silver and diamonds. <laughs> that That's they right. Admire. That's right. And each one has a different meaning. To me, it's not as important the gold and the diamonds and the silver. To someone else, it might be very important. But me, for me, it's the lake that's really important. Right. Okay. Right. So the fact that the princes were punished at the end, to me, I haven't really processed that a lot. And I'd love for some of our listeners to think, why were the princes punished at the end? But what I'd love to do is talk about the prince now. So do you like the prince? What do you think about the prince? He meets an old woman. He puts, she gives him an invisible cloak and he goes down with the girls. What's your impression of him? Well, first I thought it was a pretty fairly typical kind of thing, right? Because the prince is going to come save the day or get the girl or, or whatever it is. Um, you know, I thought it was a little shady. <laughs> You know, all of a sudden the old woman's there to the rescue to help him out with her invisibility or her magic cloak. And he's basically getting the girl by being de devious and, you know, secretive and, you know, not in a fun, mysterious, romantic kind of way, but in a stalker kind of way. And and that's how that's how he gets the girl. But he's rewarded with the girl and 
the kingdom. Okay, so he's rewarded. I completely agree with you. The invisible cloak, invisibility is usually, um, it usually means something, a deception, just what you're saying. And we have a prince who follows these girls three nights in a row into their subconscious, into their dreams. He doesn't want them to know that he is actually spying on their most cherished dreams. And the youngest in the story, sometimes we're talking about a version with 12. There's some versions with three, but in all of them, it's the youngest warning the eldest sister that some, something's wrong and the eldest does not pay attention. And if you remember, at the end, the prince chooses the eldest daughter. Yes. Now, the king tells him he can choose whatever daughter he wants. He doesn't say, daughters, would you, which, which one of you would like the prince? Again, it's an obligation. This is a forced marriage. Yeah. Uh, it's something else I want especially girls to realize that if they're not thinking about this, if they're not conscious of what's really happening, they're imbibing the fact that it seems really wonderful. The prince is rewarded with an ability by by forcing a girl to marry him. And it's the eldest daughter. The youngest one is actually saved from not having to marry. And she's allowed to go print in the end. The, the other 11 daughters can have their 11 princes after the curse is revoked. That's what I wondered about. It's like, okay, what happens after those three days? What happens to the other 11 girls? Do they, do they get, what do they, what happens to them? Okay. So you've satisfied a curiosity that I was right. wondering about. And actually that's a perfect, you say you've satisfied my curiosity and also is satisfying because they get to choose who they're going to marry. The eldest daughter does not get to choose. That's not okay. It's not okay. And you know, it's funny. I have lots of really great conversations with my oldest son and a lot of times He's like, man, you guys work all this stuff out with the oldest and then, you know, the younger ones have it easier or a little bit more lax. And so that's, that's kind of a, a funny moment for me right now. It's the eldest. Yeah. Who had to take the brunt so that the other sisters are able to live a better life. Hmm. Yeah. And I just wonder, I'm not refuting what you're saying. I'm thinking about it, but is she doing it so that her sisters can live the life they wanted or she doesn't really have a choice? The King says you choose. Oh. Yeah. I yeah. mean, I don't think she has a choice. Right. I think that just in that situation, it may not be working out for her, but ultimately she is, whether she wanted to or not, kind of paving the way for something different for those that come after her. Well, that's really nice. So it sort of it sort of gives you um, a heroine where I did not see a heroine. So I love that you're interpreting in a different way than I did. Well, um, I didn't see heroin until you just got me to think about this a little bit more. At first, I was like, you go, princesses, you go dance the night away and have some fun. And now I've got all sorts of stuff in my mind about this fairy tale. <laughs> Okay, and we're we're missing one of the most important elements, and that is the worn out shoes. So what is the symbolism of the worn out shoes? Okay, see, <laughs> when I was reading it, I just took the worn out shoes as evidence of the princesses who were enjoying themselves and dancing the night away. I did wonder how a pair of shoes could get so worn out in just one night, but hey, it's a fairy tale. But I have a feeling you're going to, broaden my thinking right now and tell me something else about the worn out shoes. So what is it, Donna? <laughs> well, if you remember when these fairy tales are written, the shoes were, were made of, you know, very, probably not very um, strong. What's it called? Sorry, I'm forgetting words. Um, material, material. We don't have Nike. We didn't live in Nike and Adidas then. We just had, you know, something that these women had. Glass. Right, <laughs> Glass slippers. Right. <laughs> But really, in one night, they wore out their shoes. So what are shoes? Shoes protect feet. Feet take us places. Um, they're connected to legs, which is also symbolic of standing on our on our own um, beliefs, deciding where we want to go. These girls did not have a choice of where they wanted to go. So worn out shoes often has the meaning, the symbolic meaning of spiritual frustration, because they couldn't go where they wanted to. They were locked in their rooms every night without their permission. So the very, it's, sometimes the, the fairy tale is called the 12 dancing princess and sometimes it's called the 12 worn out shoes. So the, the most important element in the story is about spiritual frustration. They are not allowed to choose their own lives until the very end where the 11 of them could. So 
There we are. There we are. And what is some deeper meaning? I mean, we could say that the younger daughter was trying, the younger sister was trying to warn her sisters about an intruder. The eldest didn't listen. Maybe we need to pay attention to either spiritual signs in our lives or someone warning us or a feeling in our body that something isn't right. Maybe. Those premonitions, those inklings, those things are there to serve us. And we do often ignore them. Yeah. Okay. Right. So we want to we want to think about these. I love analyzing things and how does this transfer over to my real life? I think there's maybe a positive and a negative, although maybe you'll say they're both positive. When I see someone, for instance, on the street who's very angry, I used to react to that anger even if it wasn't directed to me. And the more I analyze fairy tales and other literature, I stop and I think what is behind that? Maybe something horrible happened to them that day. Maybe they're just trying to, you know, expel some angst in their body and someone got in their way at a bad time. Um, sometimes it's why didn't I get a job, for instance? I, it's, I tried so hard for that job and I didn't get it. What's wrong with me? Well, maybe that just wasn't the path for me and some other door is going to open. If we can analyze things and just sort of play with different meanings behind them, it can help us in our in our everyday lives. So what do you think? Yeah, I, I I completely agree with you. I think that's what blew my mind the last time we talked together is the way that you completely shifted the way you were thinking about fairy tales versus the way I was. And that, that was evident here. Like I'm looking down at the fairy tale and at my notes. What I thought was one thing, you opened my eyes to another, whether it was the locked door whether it was the lake, whether it was the worn out shoes, or even, you know, the the oldest versus the younger daughter in the end. I think it's so hard to do that in the midst of our own lives, right? We just feel the anger or we feel, we feel what we feel for whatever reason that we feel it. And I know for me, it's really hard to say, huh, hold up a second. Let's see if there's an alternative viewpoint, right? That doesn't come naturally to me in the moments of emotion, but I can practice that here. Like I just did with you. I practiced it on a story that I didn't know. And I thought, oh, well, what are my worn out shoes? Or, oh, you know, what do I think about this? And so I think it just plants little seeds of when something in my life or our lives comes up, We have gut reactions. We have gut instincts, whether that's a good one, a bad one, a stereotypical one based on what we think. But the idea is to consider a different viewpoint or a different perspective. And we can do that first on the page and then in the book. So I I think that's a, a huge important takeaway. Yeah, I love that. I have nothing to say further because you said it so beautifully. And I think that we need to practice. And it's true. The fact that I analyze, I take the time to analyze fairy tales and other literature calmly by myself and write it all out helps me process it. In the moment, we're human, for goodness sake. And we're going to react maybe sometimes more than others. But if we can practice um, taking a step back, and looking at it and try to see it differently. Oh my goodness, wouldn't this world be a nicer place to be in? Yeah, yeah, definitely more empathy building uh, through books there. So do you recommend, because I, I keep track of my reading life. I have a book journal. I write about the books that I read. I do my morning pages every morning of all the themes that are coming up. Is that something that you recommend so when you say you analyze is that an in the head analysis are you a paper pencil paper pencil notebooker and do you recommend that when you are reading books or fairy tales for the purpose of really digging deep do you recommend that we write with you know a notebook by our side or at least after to process it's a really interesting question stephanie i love that you write you have notes for all of your books i love that i'm thinking good lord i have never done that <laughs> I only started a couple years ago, so I don't have them for all, but a couple years. No, I had another friend who did the same thing and she did it so that she could have something to talk to, uh, talk about at the dinner table. And I think that's, that's wonderful. My my mind is, um, I have a very strange memory where if it's not important, my mind doesn't keep it. 
And so it's gone. And even if I love a book, it's more the emotion for me. It's the emotion part of reading something. And I don't remember details very well. So when you ask me if it's important to have a piece of paper and a pen or whatever, a typewriter, um, excuse me, that dated me, computer. <laughs> yeah. I, I loved mine. <laughs> right. I think it's really what is a, what is our goal? And um, when I'm doing when I'm talking to you about fairy tales, I need to process it. I need to read it and process it and then write it. And if I don't write it, then I will forget major points that I'm trying to make because my mind jumps back and forth. And that doesn't help the listener at all. It just, you know, I'm just speaking to speak. So it all depends on the objective. But yeah, I would love for our listeners, Stephanie, to read a fairy tale and make some notes about different perspectives that they could sort of glean from them and then send it to us. And then we could read some of those. Yeah. And send us too just the fairy tales either that you know and love that you would love for Donna to flip on its head and give us something to think about or, you know, ones that are brand new to you so that you can broaden your ideas of of fairy tales as well my fairy tale knowledge is pretty traditional I would say and limited to what I was introduced to as a kid and so that's why I love this series we've got going because I know we're going to talk about things I haven't heard of which means I'm going to learn things that I didn't know I needed to learn and be able to bring those lessons so I'm excited the plan right is to do this the first Friday of every month Fairy tale flip first fight of every month. Yep. I, I love, love that alliteration. Love it. Yeah. I can't say it very quickly, but I do love, I do love the title. <laughs> oh, we're going to have a competition about our listeners who can say it the fastest and the most times. There we go. There I we like go. it. I yeah. like it. And so, as I said, you up my game because it may not be a new fairy tale for me or maybe, but it helps me just have so much fun analyzing it and see how I can sort of shock you, Stephanie. Yes. And you did today. You did yeah. right off the bat. <laughs> didn't mean to, but didn't mean to. I really didn't mean to. It's a, it's a valid no, I, Okay. <laughs> I think it's good. I think, I think it's good. That's what I like reading to do, to just, when it stops you in your tracks and it's like, whoa, I didn't think about it that way. Or we, we really, we need to. So I loved it. And I love that it's in the moment, right? We didn't, we didn't, we don't rehearse. We just chat. We've yeah. just been chatting about them. And so listeners can think about, um, you know, how they might do the same. So I'm looking forward to this. This, this oh. will be. So looking forward to this. This has been the f the f most fantastic first episode. Can't wait to <laughs> flip some more. I'm, I'm working on that, people. Sorry about that. No, but I really do mean it. This has been wonderful. So I really look forward to the next one. And in the meantime, let's see what our listeners send us to talk about next time. Yes, absolutely. See you next month, everybody. <laughs>